So now let's take a look at species. Indiana has a large variety of species. There's 227 different species in Indiana. Where do we get this information? Well, Indiana University was blessed with having a, uh, a scientist, uh, Thomas P. Simon, who wrote this book, Fishes of Indiana. He was a, a professor here in um, uh, biology. He also uh, was a professor at Ohio State University. Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago, very suddenly, very tragic. This book is wonderful. If you are a real, you know, dedicated uh, a fisherman, I would recommend you take a look at this. It's not going to give you you know, inside baseball tips on catching largemouth bass, but it goes into exhaustive detail about the various fish that largemouth bass eat with very wonderful illustrations um, by Joseph R. Tomarelli. I'm sure I butchered that name. So anyway, um, if we take a look at the um, how Indiana ranks in the U.S., we are actually quite high. We're, we're number four. Um, in fact, we are number one in the Big Ten. <laughs> we, we don't say that much any, anymore. You know, we've beat out Michigan, Ohio, Illinois. Um, poor Rhode Island, you know, it, it only has 32 species. Well, it's a very small state, and it's largely coastal. So, uh, total between the U.S. and, uh, and Mexico, there's about 950 different species of fish. If you can get your hands on this book, I, it's well worth a cruise in class. I, I normally pass this around. Now, I want to talk about watersheds. This is something you probably have not heard of since uh what eighth grade eighth grade science class so we here in indiana most of us here in indiana live in the mississippi river watershed so everything from bloomington uh drains downstream into the white river which goes into the wabash river which goes into the ohio river which goes into the Mississippi River, which goes into the Gulf of Mexico. But you can see that there are some areas in the northeast and the northwest corners of the state that don't follow that same pattern. So Indiana is unique in that we actually are part of three different unique watersheds. Most of the state drains into the Ohio River watershed, which then goes to the Mississippi. But in the northwest corner, we have one high area that drains into the Mississippi directly. We also have an area that drains into the Atlantic Ocean. This is the blue area here in the, the illustration. So all of this area up here, you know, near, um, what would that be, um, uh, East Chicago, uh, Gary, that is going to flow, obviously, into Lake Michigan. But over here in St. Uh, Joe uh, County, um, that is going to drain into the Great Lakes into the St. Lawrence River, into the Atlantic Ocean. There's a point of concern right up here that we're going to talk about in a, 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 few, um, a few lectures a little bit later. If we look locally here in Monroe County, this is Bloomington sitting over here, and this shows Lake Monroe watershed. And so all this area bounded by the red line is part of the Lake Monroe watershed. 
Lake Monroe is the water source for Bloomington and Indiana University. This shows the various streams that drain into Lake Monroe. Um, this I pulled this um, illustration uh, from a website of Friends of uh, Lake Monroe, and it shows various sampling uh, locations that they have uh, around the watershed. Okay, enough about watersheds. So where do you actually want to go fishing? I really think one of the very best uh, things you can do is to jump on the DNR website. Let's take a look. Here we are on the DNR website, in.gov. And here's the, the fishing regulation guide. Uh, you can click right here and uh, read that. Uh, also, here's where you would buy your, your fishing license. And if we scroll down, it has where to go, where to fish map. Let's check this out. Now we need to click on the where to fish interactive map and this will load. A little disclaimer information box, we'll click off on that and we'll start to scroll in. Information box over here, telling you a little bit more, but very quickly, let me just go through this. Uh, let's focus in around Bloomington. Um, here's Lake, uh, Lake Lemon, and if we click on that little balloon, it pops up Lake Lemon Fish Conservancy Advisory. This gives you a, a little warning about what you can eat and what you, you can't eat. And if we continue on, it gets into the, um, uh, the type of water, uh, the who maintains this, uh, this body of water. Uh, does it have a boat ramp? Yes. Uh, shoreline or motor restrictions? Uh, actually, it does, but it's not listed here. And is a fee uh, charged to launch your boat? Yes, there is. And down here, it will give you the more prominent... Uh, uh, species. If we come down and take a look at Lake Griffey over here, you ha have the body of water. Uh, you can see that the species are uh, bluegill, red ear, catfish, uh, crappie, and largemouth bass. If we kind of zoom out a little bit, You'll see a lot of these balloons up here. This is a Honker Haven uh, in Johnson County. It's part of the Atterbury Fish and Wildlife Area. And it goes through uh, motor restrictions. It's a uh, electric uh, trolling motor only. Uh, some of these will give you the, the size, the acreage of the lake. And this has uh, your typical largemouth bass bluegill uh, mix. And if we come out here in the, the Hoosier National Forest and click on this one, uh, Grouse Hollow Lake, electric motor only, uh, gives you latitude and longitude or the UTM coordinates, uh, the species. This has more information. Uh, Henderson Pond uh, right next uh, to it uh, gives you the information. So this can really help you in scouting out areas and how to get there. Um, this looks interesting. Uh, Lawrence Port. East Fork of the White River. Yeah, there you go. Uh, public Access South, uh, Williams Dam, and Carp, Catfish, Crappie, Largemouth Bass, and uh, uh, Sauger, uh, which we haven't talked about. Uh, shoreline fishing, a type of ramp, concrete, uh, so on and so forth. So there you go. Uh, the entire state. Lots of good information on here. And it's a very, very quick and easy way to, to see what's nearby. Discover places you may not, you know, normally have, uh, would have thought of. So, check it out. 
All right. I think they have done a wonderful job with that. Obviously, they've put some time and effort into it, and that is just a real nice um, uh, collection of, of data that's literally at our fingertips. Um, Google Maps, Google Earth is also a wonderful resource. You can literally do a flyover of you know likely suspected um, fish holding bodies of water. You can scout. Uh, there are also apps that allow you to figure out who owns property in a specific area. I know this is used in the uh, in in hunting um, quite a bit. There are fishing maps. I don't want to discount the old analog solutions. Uh, maps never lose signal. They never lose their batteries. They're always around, barring fire. Um, I have several fishing maps for, for various lakes. They contain really good information. Sometimes they're, I mean, you literally could be using a 25-year-old map, but, you know, you'll probably still catch fish, you know, based on the information that is there. Um, there's also a book, uh, a series called The Gazetteers. These are collections of of topographic style maps that show in minute detail every road every bridge every building absolutely it, it, it's, it's kind of uh, google analog in fact a lot of that they took from the gazetteers um they're handy to have in a vehicle you know, whenever you don't have cell signal, whenever the batteries are are, are dead, uh, this thing still works. Let's really start taking a deep dive into fish species. And in the in unit one, we just kind of did a, a a cursory yeah this is what you're going to probably catch um, now let's really start looking at these in in much more detail and one of the things we're going to do is to start breaking them into the various groups the largest group that we're going to separate the uh, 200 and what was it 27 species is between saltwater and freshwater Obviously, we don't have any salt water here in Indiana, but that does not mean that we don't have any salt water species here in Indiana. Uh, then, obviously, you have the fresh water. So, those are the, the two real big divisions that we are going to put fish into. Now, the, the, the next division is going to be between warm water species and cold water species. What the heck is that? It's really simple. A warm water species fish is one thing, one that can live comfortably above about 72 degrees. Okay, get that seared into your brain. In essence, almost all fish in Indiana are warm water species. Because, I mean, our lake temperatures can easily get up into the 80s. I mean, it's, it's bath water, you know, in the middle of the summer. And the fish handle that quite well. And there is cold water species of fish. Now, these are fish that cannot live above about 72 degrees. And these, in essence, are all of the, the, the salmonoids, uh, the trout, uh, salmon. We have trout in Indiana. We'll talk about that um, in a few minutes. But just really get this fixed in your brain. Cold water cannot live above 72. Warm water can live above 72. Now, something that is very important to fishermen is the distinction between game fish and rough fish. So game fish are predators. They are fish that see food, attack food, eat food. 
So if they see a worm floating on a, on a line under a bobber, they will go up and eat that food. If they see something that looks like and kind of sounds like an injured minnow, they will chase that down and eat it. That is a predator. That's a, a game fish. There are fish who do not do that. They could literally, they could care less. We call these rough fish. Sometimes we'll call them trash fish. These are fish that, that don't do that. That's just not their style. They don't eat that way. And a, a real good example of that would be, you know, carp. Carp's not going to chase down a, a rapala minnow. Um, uh, shad. Or they won't even give it a, a second thought. So we'll get into into this and and we'll we'll talk about some of the nuances with this category of rough fish. Some fish that I grew up with are actually heavily targeted by fishermen now. Uh, carp and catfish. Catfish used to be a trash fish. We only fished for catfish when we got really hungry. I mean, it was not... It's like, oh gosh, we got another catfish. Um, now, there's an entire industry that has grown up uh, around catfishing. So we'll get into uh, more of that whenever we uh, get into the individual species. So ju just remember these, these, these groups. Saltwater, freshwater. Cold water species, warm water species. Game fish, rough fish. Okay? Let's go in and take a look at the individual family groups of fish. And one of the very first ones is called the panfish. Why are they called panfish? I think it should be pretty obvious here. These are fish that fit really well into a cast iron skillet with a little bit of oil, and you fry them up and eat them. We are predators. So the, the, the panfish family are all warm water fish, they're all predators, and they are all highly adaptable. Last unit we talked about bluegill. This unit, let's talk about a pumpkin seed. Pumpkin seeds are just absolutely gorgeous. Now, they're only found in, in northern Indiana. Uh, how do I kn know that? Well, I referred to Fishes of Indiana that has a really nice illustrated map that shows the, the territory of all of these different species. It's a wonderful book, wonderful book. Anyway, pumpkin seeds. If, if you've ever caught one, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is probably the most beautiful freshwater fish in North America. These things are just absolutely gorgeous to look at. Overall, they're kind of orangish with red speckles through here. Um, they have this absolutely gorgeous gorgeous uh, iridescent turquoise marbling you know along their 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 gill cover and and under their their their, their mouth uh, just f fascinating and then we we mold in these various shades and hues of of, of green blue uh, scales um, up along their back and and along their gill cover and and the the you know staying with the bluegill you know theme it, it does have that that dark blue almost black patch uh, with a, a little bit of red so it, it borrows something from the from the red ear these are a very um, um, stocky fish uh, they they are a flat fish you know so that they're they're um, they're higher than they are wide but but they're still pretty broad and very chunky very meaty fish uh, i have eaten them they are very good they're a, a, a bluegill you know um a relative um we, do, we just don't see them uh here here in uh, uh, the uh, bloomington monroe county area uh, we have to go north where i grew up in eastern ohio i could catch these these all the time 
a wonderful little fish. And we also have black, uh, black crop, crappie. Uh, we talked about the white crappie um, last unit. Now we talk about the uh, black crappie. Basically the same fish. Um, ideal water temperature, 70, 75 degrees. Average size around 7. I'd even go 8 inches now. It is not at all uncommon you know, to get, you know, a foot long crappie, you know, 12, 14 inches, you know, big slabs. Largemouth bass. I promised you a story about largemouth bass, and I'll go ahead and deliver it. This is a, a very diplomatic fish. We don't often think about fish as diplomats, but we tried to use this about a hundred years ago in Japan. We were establishing relationships with the Empire of Japan. Uh, I think this was around 1908 or so, 1910. And what is common in diplomacy is the exchange of gifts. The U.S. thought it would be wonderful to introduce Japan to our wonderful largemouth bass. And so we had a whole bunch of these shipped over to Japan, and they were released in the uh, imperial ponds surrounding the imperial palace. It didn't go well. The, the emperor was absolutely incensed by this invasion of, of the, this foreign you know, species into the, the the empire and he ordered all the ponds drained and all the fish killed so that didn't go over so well well intentioned but not well received fast forward through world war one world war two the defeat of japan uh the empire of japan and the rebuilding of japan the U.S. put tremendous effort into rebuilding the industry, the economy of Japan following the war. One of the things that they did was get the factories back up and producing. And we gave them things to produce. We thought it was a great idea if we could really increase their... their uh, uh, production of photography equipment. Now, the Japanese were absolute masters of, of photography and, and optics. They had su far superior night vision uh, optics during uh, World War II, uh, much to our chagrin. Um, <clears throat> so we, we, we helped them, you know, build factories to develop techniques, technology, uh, f for mass production of, of photography equipment. And, you know, a lot of you probably know that, that the Japanese have dominated that, that market, uh, since about the 1970s. Uh, we also, uh, helped them increase, uh, automobile production, which, that's kind of obvious with the number of, of Japanese vehicles in the U.S. now. We also encouraged them to produce fishing equipment. And I had mentioned earlier that the Midwest, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Michigan, were, were kind of the epicenter of uh, artificial lure production starting in the late 1890s. Well, a lot of this was uh, transferred to Japan um, in the form of lure, hooks, um, rod and reel production. And today we can see the, uh, the result of, of that uh, with um, a tremendous amount of lures coming out of, out of uh, the really, really, really good lures. The like $50 a piece lures, you know, are coming out of, of Japan. Um, uh, Shimano, you know, is a you know, the Japanese company. So that was very successful. We also um, got them to produce bamboo fly rods. And you might come across a bamboo fly rod and having looked through an Orvis catalog, seeing bamboo fly rods running for, you know, $2,500, um, $3,500, 
think that you've found, uh, <laughs> you know, this is going on eBay. Um, probably not. These were very mm, low quality fly rods. Um, I have one. My my uncle gave it to me. I, I thought I had a, I, to be honest with you, I was afraid to use it because, you know, I didn't want to break something that was this this valuable. And I took it to a, a fly fishing shop um, in Columbus, Ohio, 40 years ago. And he looked at it and says, yeah, you've got one of the, the $50 Japanese fly rods. And I was honestly relieved to know that this was only worth about 50 bucks because then I started to use it a lot more, and I, and I got a tremendous enjoyment out of that fly rod. Anyway, um, so that's kind of a quick story about uh, largemouth bass and uh, diplomatic efforts um, by the U.S. State Department. Uh, world record, 22 pounds, 4 ounces. As I mentioned, this is... Mm, Looking like this is not really true. Um, today, a 10-pound bass is largemouth is is very significant. I mean, they don't happen uh, every day. Um, average size 14 inches, which also happens to be the minimum length uh, for keeping a fish caught in in a lake. Uh, 13 inches, the minimum length uh, caught in in a river. Again, check the regulations because. They vary from county to county and body of water to body of water. So always make sure that you're, you're reading those, those regulations. We are blessed with Lake Monroe. One of the criteria when building Lake Monroe was to make it a world-class largemouth bass um, fishery. And they've, I think, have done a pretty good job uh, at that. Again, me not being a, a, a fanatical largemouth bass fisherman, um, we have several tournaments and some very good catches on, on Lake Monroe. Let's talk about smallmouth bass. These are a unique fish, almost found most exclusively in the northern part of Indiana. These fish prefer cooler water. And if you see the ideal temperature, 60 to 70 degrees, where largemouth bass is, is uh, much higher. Um, they really prefer moving water and, and ideally streams. Now we do have um, a Sugar Creek uh, over near Crawfordsville, um, and the uh, Blue River, which is down south uh, in uh, Milltown, um, very good, very good largemouth streams. I've honestly not had much of an opportunity to fish uh, those areas. Uh, we also have Indian Creek down near Bedford, which I've been told uh, contains some nice uh, smallies. I've never had a, a chance to fish there. They're generally smaller than largemouth bass, um, average size about 12 inches. Um, sometimes they're referred to as warm water trout or green trout because they operate very similar to, to trout. Um, these are a favorite fish of fly fishermen. Uh, you can get out on a, on a river, you can wade, you can do a drift boat, and, and just have an absolute wonderful time um, fishing for, for these uh, fish. Why are they called smallmouth? Well, if we take a look at the location of their eye in relationship to the corner of their jaw, we can see that the jaw is actually forward of a vertical line drawn through the center of the eye. Where if we look at the largemouth bass, if we drop a vertical line down through the eye, we can see that the jaw is behind that line or aft of that line. So that's, that's one of the distinguishing factors. The General coloration is a little bit more green, a little bit more <clears throat> striped, and 
smallmouth bass have this this brilliant red eye. However, that's not always the case. Don't use a red eye as the, the determining factor because there's other species that, that can kind of uh, uh, have that same characteristic. Otherwise, a wonderful predator, just, just a, a fabulous fish to go after. We see fish, these fish more prevalent the further north you go in North America. In fact, there's almost a reverse relationship between smallmouth and largemouth. The further north you go, you know, let's say Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Canada, the more smallmouth bass you're going to find and the fewer largemouth bass you're going to find. Largemouth really thrive in warm water, and smallmouth they don't do so well in, in warm water. Remember, both of these are warm water species. One simply prefers cooler temperatures than the other. Spotted bass or Kentucky bass uh, are, are found um, uh, throughout Indiana. These fish are, are heavily stocked. Uh, you, you'll see them around, you know, de developments, um, a little bit cheaper than largemouth bass, a little bit more adaptable than smallmouth bass, uh, just a good solid fighter. Uh, average size about 12 inches, so a little smaller than the largemouth, um, but still a very, very good fish. And, and aptly named, you can see these spots, you know, along the, 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 the side of, of, of the fish. Here's a, a category that I, I want to mention, black bass. This is a, a term that, that DNR uses um, and, and the scientific community uses to describe kind of a collection of these larger panfish species, the largemouth, the smallmouth, the spotted bass, uh, the red-eye bass. And there's actually a, a, a few others mixed in there. And you'll, you'll read in the DNR fishing regulations where they'll t talk about the possession limit of black bass. And that term black bass simply means the aggregate of these species. So you could catch you know, two largemouth bass and three smallmouth bass, and you would have five black bass. So that, that's, that's just a term. In, in, in uh, scientific um, uh, uh, writings, research, you'll see the, the term black bass used to differentiate from, from other uh, groups. So this is kind of a subgroup of the, of the panfish uh, species. Okay, so that kind of wraps uh, up the uh, the panfish species. Next, we'll get into the the the, the true bass.